great. Great to have all of you in the session. All right, so let's get started. Welcome to the first session on big data with Hadoop and Spark. So this session was supposed to be on big data with Spark, but since uh, a lot of uh, a lot of learners had requested that let it be both Hadoop and Spark, so we kept both. All right. So I hope that'll be okay for all of all of uh, the attendees. All right. So great, great to have all of you in the session. If you have any questions, use the Q&A window. There are two windows. One is Q&A, and other is the other is the chat window. All right. All right, so this is the first session on big data with Spark and Hadoop. This, this session introduces the, introduces the learner or introduces the attendee with the big data stack along with the Hadoop and Spark stack. All right, we will also be introducing the CloudX lab and we'll also be talking about how, how, uh, how our courses and, uh, and the lab works. All right, so this session generally suffices as the introduction to big data, as well as the overview of Hadoop and Spark. And this ses session serves as the first step in this direction. All right, so the, the format of the session is that th today we are going to talk about the big data, what, why, and the use case, and the various solutions. The total session is of three hours duration with 10 minutes break in the midway. After the break, we cover Spark and Hadoop architecture along with the hands-on, all right? So please introduce yourself using chat window while others are joining. The session is being recorded and the recordings along with the presentation will be shared with all of you. This is the first of uh, 10 sessions of Big Data with Spark specialization. It generally suffices as an introduction to the Big Data technology stack. To ask questions, everyone, everyone except me is muted. So please ask questions by typing in the Q&A window. Notice that there are two windows, one is chat, other is Q&A. My focus is going to be on the Q&A window, right? And, uh, let me just take a look at the Q&A window right now. There are no questions. All right. So there is a Q&A window. There is a chat window. And use chat window to introduce yourself. And if you want to ask a question, please ask using Q&A window. This format is only for the first session because there are quite a few attendees. Right now, I can see that around 73 attendees are there. and. Uh, Therefore, we have two, uh, two ways to communicate. One is chat, other is Q&A. All right, so I will read out the questions before answering. All right, and to get better answers, keep your messages short and avoid the chat, chat language. All right, that, that makes it easier for everyone to understand. All right. Okay, so great, great to have your introductions. So please, uh, let's just get started. All right, so this session is uh, sound very basic to most of you, all right? But we will cover the stack after a break. That'll be those who have already been through the introduction, that they will find the introduction of the stack more relevant. All right, great. 
All right. So this is uh, the first session of the Big Data with Spark course. Big Data with Spark course is one of the best courses available on the internet today. Uh, it has 30 plus hours of training, 90 days of lab, 24 by 7 support projects and compatible with Hortonworks and Cloudera certifications. Next session is going to be on 29th September, uh, meaning next Saturday. And uh, the time is from 8 to 11. All right. So those who have just logged in, they can take a look at the agenda. This is the agenda and all right, I hope that you are able to see my screen. All right, great, great to have the audience from all over the world. We have, we have people from Mexico, Amsterdam, UK and Vancouver and Rokla and Bangalore, India, Indonesia, and New Jersey. So we have uh, the learners from across the globe. So, and we have, okay, this is very interesting. We have from Jakarta, Manitoba, and Chennai. Wonderful, wonderful to have all of you in the session. All right. So I hope the agenda is very clear to everybody. So let's get started. All right, a brief about CloudX Lab. CloudX Lab is making learning fun and durable, meaning for the life. All right. We have, how are we making it fun in life? Either by live sessions like this and the videos, along with the quizzes, hands-on, and projects and case studies, all of these based on the real life, uh, real life projects. Okay. All right. The one thing that uh, CloudX Lab has done very differently from everyone is the focus on hands-on assessment by the way of our online signature lab. That's basically one of the best labs. And we are the pioneer of creating the lab so the focus is on learning by doing. And so you have uh, in, in CloudX Lab, as part of the assessment and assignments, we have problem statement. And you have to do hands-on at the CloudX Lab after logging into the terminal or using Jupyter or the other, other components. You will get the, uh, it will automatically check whether you have solved the problem or not. Please note that this is not the usual coding exercises. These are practical exercises that people do on CloudX Lab, right? They could be SQL, they could be Hive, they could be HDFS. The assessment is the well-rounded instead of just focusing on the coding, all right? So that's some, something that we have built and that is unique about CloudX Lab, all right? So, so we focus a lot on self-learning self by doing things. And uh, the, the, these such kind of discussions, the one that we are having right now, they, are, they just get you started in that, in that direction, all right? And rest will be done along with the CloudX Lab. You will log in, you will have to, uh, like for example, here it's asking you to log in. Once you log in, you can click on I'm done and it'll check. Similarly here, it's asking you to write code on the right-hand side. And once you have done that, it will basically give you points and say, good, good job. All right. So we have, we have quite a few things such as job portals and other features on the website. So we basically connect your skills with the job and job in the market. So it, our portal helps you figuring out how are you play, how well you are placed with respect to a job. All right, so the idea is to help people upskill in their career by the way of very highly engaging environment to play around and do hands on. Because if you do the hands on, the chances of you um, rising in your career is very high. All right, so probably this is the only session in which there will be 
um, more theory, meaning I'll be talking more. And as compared to our other sessions in which all of us will be locked in and doing things along with me. All right. So, so since this is a generic session, it's for wide, wide, wide audience. And therefore, here, I may not right away go into the go into the environment and, and do the hands on together. All right. So I hope everybody is on the same page. Feel free to ask questions using Q&A window and use the chat window for for the general um, talks. OK, and uh, avoid avoid marketing on the chat. That is something that that is not permissible. And uh, uh, all right. So I'm Sandeep Giri. I'm the course instructor for this uh, Big Data with Spark course. And I graduated long back from my Rookie. And afterwards, most of my career, I have worked on large scale or high performance computing. I, I worked with Amazon, Inmobi, and DE Shaw. And I also started a company called Tibets Global earlier. And at Amazon, uh, Inmobi, and DE Shaw, I have mostly done the large scale computing, either in machine learning or in hum in processing humongous data or catering to last set of users. All right, so at heart, I'm an engineer and I love explaining technologies to everyone. And that's the reason I started CloudX Lab. All right, a question from, a question from Green. Uh, which team in Amazon? As I am an engineer. Oh, good, good to know you, Green. I am at. I was with Amazon Detail Page, the mobile version of the Detail Page that has been dialed up now, is something that um, I built, and uh, I was there for one and a half or close to two years with Amazon. I see. Wonderful, wonderful to have you here. Great. So. All right, so a question is uh, request you to please clarify what is Spark, Hive, Pig, and all. Yes, we will, we will do that towards the end, okay? First half is going to be uh, understanding big data. Second half is going to be in the technology. We are going to go over every piece of, uh, every component of Hadoop and Spark ecosystem. All right. The purpose of these sessions is to have to, to give a general good enough overview so that uh, so that attendee can decide whether they want to they want to go further into developer dev, uh, the, the developer or architect course or they they would like to go towards the managed management courses. All right. So so basically that's the that's about me. And now moving ahead, the objective of the course is to learn learn to process big data using Spark and Hadoop. We have already covered. All right. So in the usual way, let me start with defining few terms so that so that you become comfortable. 90% of the problem uh, with the new technology is the terminology. So it's very important to clarify the, the terminology and and bring everybody on the same page when we talk about concepts and the ideas. All right. So the first con the first uh, concept that will be, uh, you know, will be coming again and again is the very variety of data, the structured, unstructured, and semi-structured data, right? What are the, what is structured data, all right? What is structured data? Structured data is a data in which you for sure know what are the columns and what are their data types? Like, for example, when you see something in a database, what is a database? Database has a table in which it has a column and rows. And the columns are the, every column has pre-specified data type. Every column has pre-specified data type. And in the whole column, there cannot be any other uh, any other type of data than what is specified. Now you might be wondering what is a type. Type is like integer, like a number. Type could be um, a string, text, or it could be a binary value, or it could be a large object such as a file. 
All right. So basically, the the idea of a structured data is is that the data in which we for sure know the fields and their data type is called structured data. The on the other hand, we have unstructured data. On the other hand, we have unstructured data in which we neither know what are the fields nor it has the idea of the data types, right? And in midway, we have semi-structured data. Data. In this kind of data, we have the fields. We know for sure that these are columns, right? And and the only problem with semi-structured data is we are never sure that what what is the data type of each column? What is the data type of each column? And the process of converting unstructured data to structured data is known as ETL. ETL is a big industry in software industry. ETL is extract, transform, and load. We take this kind of data and then we convert it into structured. That's what is known as the ETL process. Similarly, converting semi-structured to structured is also part of ETL process. Sometimes in ETL, we just transmit this data to another form and so on. That is also part of ETL. Now, the examples of structured data is the data in databases because we for sure know that all the columns are going to have same data types. The example of semi-structured is the data in comma-separated values like csv file tsv file right tab separated values similarly the json objects are also considered as semi objects semi structured now the the example of unstructured data is the data in plain text files because we don't have a clue that it has columns all right now it has uh, columns and and so on so like for example you have got a plain text file or you have got a binary object in the form of any of the excel sheet and so on uh, or google docs or or any other form in which we have no no concept of columns that's called unstructured data question is what is json json is javascript object notation when you have a complex object, when you have like rows and columns, it's so easy to represent it using comma separated values or in, in an Excel sheet. But you have a, when you have a complex object in which each, each value could be further a complex object, okay? In those cases, it's very difficult to represent that complex object using um, normal CSV file or Excel sheet. In those cases, what we do is we use something called JSON, JavaScript object notation, to save the data in the file system, or we use XML. XML is extensible markup language, the way you have in browsers, the HTML. X XML is basically the more customi customizable version of HTML. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep things very simple. So few things may not sound very precise, but they are good enough. These explanations are good enough. Uh, these explanations are right because I'm trying to make it extremely simple. All right. So because uh, it's a wide audience, we have 100, 107 plus people in the session. So it's better to just stay with stay with generic terminology. Okay. So, and, and uh, trust me, uh, it's not difficult to understand. So, so I'm going to keep things extremely simple and we'll go into complex only when it's required. All right. So the other term that you will hear again and again is distributed systems or distributed computing. What is distributed computing in simple words? Groups of networked computers, groups of networked computers interacting with each other to achieve a common goal. Meaning, we took many computers, connected them in the network, then we, instead of only one computer doing everything, we got the work divided amongst them. This is called distributed system. The important part is to achieve a common goal. 
because if you look at the look at the computer center like a cyber cafe or some other public place they are also networked but there we are not achieving a sing, solving a single problem using all those computers therefore it's not considered as distributed distributed system means we should be able to distribute our problem statement the problem statement could be take this data group this data by this particular column take this data uh, clean it up meaning convert it into some format or filter this data based on some criteria right those kind of problems if we want to solve right those those are the common examples of common goal like you have a humongous data you want to clean it convert it into some some other format that's called etl or it could be like a task a complicated task like uh, uh, like uh, compressing an image or decompressing an image or resizing an images or 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 um, or let's say there's a video and we want to do something with the video so the the complex task that's a goal okay and 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 that's what we are trying to achieve all right a quick question to all how many bytes in one petabyte yes just one answer all those who are part of our big data and spark course since many of you had requested to do uh, the whole thing like big data with hadoop and spark so we decided to do the whole whole um, discussion starting with hadoop and spark and uh, some of you might have attended this earlier but, but today we are going to go into a little bit more details about spark towards the second half all right the second session of this is going to be next saturday all right there also i'll do a quick recap so that you will not miss miss out anything if you have anything urgent you can join next saturday all right so those uh, those who are part of already the sec the course all right great 10 to the power 15 that's right thank you satyajit so yes Great. Now, uh, any idea how much Facebook stores uh, data in one day? Anybody? Just rough idea. All right. So it, it stores around 600 terabyte data as per their statistics okay so they're storing per day a 600 terabyte great great set of answers all right great set of answers moving ahead now this is a term that basically has been overly used called big data so we want to clarify the term before moving ahead in simple words Big data means data of huge size that cannot be processed using usual tools, right? What is a usual tool? Usual tool is like usual file system, like you have on your computer, like C colon, D colon, and so on. That's a file system. So when we cannot store huge data on that file system, then we call it big data. All right, so the examples of usual, usual tools could be your usual databases. If your usual databases cannot handle that kind of data. A question is in memory or on disk, on the disk of course, and uh, yeah. The third one is the, and for such kind of data, the most important part when we talk about big data is distributed architecture is needed. All right. Those who are suggesting to move, uh, increase the pace, I understand that the my pace is slow because since the audience is from um, all across the globe, in case I uh, speak faster, the chances are they will not be able to get my mother tongue, um, mother, uh, my my accent of English. Right. That's why I'm trying to be slow and clear. All right. Thank you for that note. And 
All right. The other important part to, I, I would like to say is that these sessions are meant for discussions, Q&A sessions. So feel free to ask questions. We will try to answer your question as much as we can. Your questions, one person's questions, it could be useful for everyone. So please pay attention. And I'll repeat the question so that everybody is in the context, All right? So that's the most important part why these sessions are run. And uh, okay, so feel free to ask questions. Questioning, uh, asking questions is something that we promote very much. All right, even in our normal sessions, We have hands-on session towards the end, okay? Now, the important part is um, the big data. Big data is something for which we, our usual tools do not suffice. We require new set of tools that are distributed in nature, meaning those tools can run parallelly on multiple computers. So the core idea behind big data is, core idea behind big data is to be able to distribute the work to multiple computers. That's the core idea behind the big data. Okay. Now the characteristics of big data are volume, velocity and variety. These are the three, three characteristics of any data. Volume means data at the rest. Velocity means data in the motion and variety means data in many forms, right? So volume, when the volume becomes a problem, let's say you are trying to store humongous data on a file system and that file system is not sufficient. For example, if you think about how much data Gmail stores per day, or how much data Facebook stores per day that cannot be done using one computer. You need distributed computing even for handling the volume. Second is velocity. Velocity is data in motion. Data in motion. So problems involving handling of the data coming at the very fast rate, that is, number of requests being received by Facebook as you, as the whole world actually visits Facebook and YouTube, for example. So data in motion is when you are accessing data at a very fast rate and you have to, and, and, and this has to be handled on the server side, that is called handling the data in motion. And when you have humongous, humongous data in motion, then you cannot really handle it using one node, you will have to have distributed computing, right? Third is variety. Variety is data in many forms. Now, the variety might look really confusing at times. So, so variety belongs to two, two parts. One is data in many forms. And second is the complex computing. The computing are in many forms. Okay, say for example, you have complex data structures such as, such as Google Maps, and you want to find out the way from one point to another. Finding the way in a Google Map uh, or in any map is a very challenging task because you have to first find, find all possible ways and then you have to find the shortest path. Even if the data is, is, is small, even then, the variety kind of problems could take a lot of time to do the processing. Similar is the case with building recommendations. Even if your data is small, that can fit on one disk easily. Even then, even then, the the problem of recommendation or finding a way in a map or let's say let's say querying a social graph. All of these problems take a lot of time and the computing resources. That's not generally possible using a single computer and therefore we need distributed computing. So in simple words, when, when you cannot handle volume, velo velocity and uh, variety along with the complexity of computing using, uh, using usual tools that which are running on one computer, you need to either build your own distributed computing system or you need to you need to 
uh, use existing one. Meaning when any of these three things become impossible to be handled by one computer, you basically go for multiple computers and you utilize, utilize multiple computers to solve your problems, all right? That's exactly the characteristic of the big data. All right, a question from Raghu is, let me answer that question. Okay, let me, okay. A question from Raghu is, it's a, uh, on the right time, so I would love to answer. And a lot of people have this question. Can you please tell us how the systems are connected in distributed architecture? Is it configured in cluster and so on? So connection, connection could be anything. As long as these computers are available to us, okay, any kind of networking is fine. The more important part about connecting the multiple computers is the software that can divide the work amongst these computers. Imagine that you are writing a simple SQL query. You are writing a query using a database. Now you wrote a complex query. Can that query be parallelly executed on 500 computers and the result be combined together to give you give you the the results from the entire data set right so the challenge with the distributed computing is not much of networking because networking is a solved problem it has been solved long long ago the challenge is with respect to the software the design of software, and that's exactly what, what happened when Hadoop or Spark or other systems were created. They were created so that we can divide our work on many computers so that, we, so that the overall computation is extremely fast, all right? So that's the sole idea behind behind big data. All the components that we talk about on, in, in case of Hadoop or Spark, all of those components have one common thing. And that common thing is they all are distributed. Whether it's a file system, whether it's a data store, whether it's a, a processing engine, whether it's a query engine, whatever the tools that we talk about, all of them have this single quality that they all are distributed. They all get work done using multiple computers, all right? I might uh, seem to make things uh, extremely simple and that's the idea, all right? So, I'll talk about yarn and other components towards the end. A question is, even Teradata and NetEza also uses the MPP where query is run on multiple nodes. Yes, that is also known as big data processing. All right, great set of questions. Keep the questions coming. All right, if you want to set up your own cluster, I have, I have posted on our blog in detail uh, a video in which we have shown how to set up the cluster. All right, you can follow that. Great, and yes. So now this is an important question that we kind of ignore all the time. Question to all of you is, let's say we have a hard disk drive. What's a hard disk drive? Hard disk drive is the magnetic drive on which we store our data. It has, internally, it's like collection of many, many, um, what do you say, floppies, or many, uh, what do you say, um, um, many platters, it's one, one on top of another. And when we ask it for the, ask, ask, it the data it basically rotates and give you now question is how much time it takes to read one terabyte from such a system anyone
Okay. Okay. All right. Notice that it is one terabyte data. One terabyte sign sounds very easy because we are, we are so so uh, comfortable in in storing those many videos or movies. But when it comes to data, when you want to process this kind of data, it takes a long time. All right. So it takes just six hours to only read not even store or do any processing. So, so one terabyte when you are uh, reading from a hard, hard disk drive, it's going to take around six hours. Yes, all those who have answered three hours or five hours, they're all okay, all right? That much variance is there between various hard drives. So, yes. So the more important part is that it takes hours to get one terabyte to be read from the disks. Okay, therefore, if you want to process humongous data, it'll take a huge, huge time. So now we know what is a petabyte. Now we know what is, um, how much time it takes to read one terabyte. Now question to all of you is that if you just have to count vowels, let's say the task is given to you that, hey, we have uh, one petabyte data. Can you just count vowels in this data every day? Do you need distributed system? One more, one more doubt is always there that it would depend, reading the data from the disk would depend on which processor do we use? The answer is no. When we are reading from the disk, like hard disk drive, the bottleneck is the hard disk drive, not the processor. Processor, almost every processor is fast enough. Okay, every processor, even if you take like 200 megahertz, that's also extremely fast processor. So processor is hardly uh, ever a bottleneck when we are reading from the disk. Okay, so the bottleneck is the disk. Therefore, the time will be dependent on the disk, not on the processor. All right, a question to all of you is, if you have to just count vowels, counting vowels is not a big deal. We check his character if it's A, E, I, O, U, and then we just uh, scan through the data. We are not going to keep entire data in the memory, or we are not also going to save this information somewhere. So question is, if we have one petabyte data, and we just need to count vowels in that one petabyte data, how much time will it take? Let's assume that it's taking six hours to read one terabyte. So it's going to take how many hours to read one petabyte data from the disk? It's going to take around 6,000 hours to just count vowels in one petabyte data, right? And therefore, you cannot get it done every day. And hence, and hence, even if somehow we stored one petabyte data on a computer, it's impossible to get the counts of just the vowels done in a day. And therefore, therefore, we need a distributed system. We need many computers, maybe thousands of computers, to do this work in parallel. If we have 1,000 computers, then it'll take six hours to get this done. And hence, we need a distributed system. All right, hence, we need a distributed system. So most of the existing systems cannot handle such kind of task in a day. All right, a good question. Question is, is distributed system required when we store and process the data in the clouds like Google Cloud and AWS Cloud? Yes, so there also either you will use their distributed system or you will set up your own distributed system like we have set up our cloud, cloud lab on AWS, right? So either you will use their system or you will use your own the distributed system to get it done, get such kind of computing done. Both Google Cloud and AWS provide their own file systems, processing engines, and so on. And, and, and that too, that too is internally distributed at Amazon or Google, All right? So great, uh, great set of questions moving ahead. 
Yes, somebody has uh, raised a hand. Yes. Come on, Jaja. If you have a question, please um, either ask using chat or, or you ask using Q&A window. All right. Great. Wonderful. And moving ahead. So, so somewhere around 2002, when the digital kind of that was the beginning of digital age, the digital the digital stories started exploring as in it, it kept on increasing from time to time from uh, uh, it, the the con consumption of the digital storage started increasing exponentially what is exponential something that increases uh, increases with time the rate or rate is increasing if the amount is increasing so so basically like a chain reaction this this to, after 2002, the, the the digital data, the digital storage has exploded. Has exploded as in it has a lot of data is being stored in the form of digital. All right. So now, <clears throat> thank you, Satyajit. All right. So yes, why did it happen? Why this became so? There were two aspects to it. One is devices, other is connectivity. And the product of the two led to so many applications. So on one hand, we had so many devices like smartphones. And on the other hand, we had, we've got the connectivity, Wi-Fi, 4G, NFC, GPS. And because of the combination of the two, we got the whole, whole plethora of apps which connect people and which make the information available. So the devices became cheaper, faster, and smaller, resulting in a man, many more applications. And that's exactly the reason today the data storage has been increasing exponentially. All right. Now, when we talk about processing, I would, before jumping into it, I would like to explain what exactly it means by processing in a computer. Those who are from computing background, they might find it trivial, but uh, this is for everyone. Okay. A question from S. William is, S. Williams is that, is there a break in between? Uh, is anybody else hearing the break? Great. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. The question was different, but uh, okay. Nevertheless, it's good to confirm whether the voice is clear or not. All right. So to process and store data, we need a computer. And what's a computer? Generally, the way we perceive computer is there's a CPU. There's an NIC network interface card, then there are disk drives, RAM. I'll go over these. What is a CPU? CPU is a processor which reads the instructions and, and runs the instructions, okay? So basically a list of instructions come to CPU and CPU basically takes one by one and then executes them. The faster it can read the instruction and execute them, the faster is CPU, okay? Okay, second is uh, the RAM. RAM is speed and RAM is characterized by speed and the size. Okay, the faster the RAM, the faster the RAM, the faster will be, faster a computer will be able to process data. So CPU reads data from RAM so that it can quickly, quickly jump to any, any value or any information extremely quickly. So that's RAM. And the data that is stored permanently is either in hard disk drive called HDD or solid state drive SSD. So while on one hand, 
hard disk drives are generally bigger and cheaper, like uh, two terabyte or one terabyte or four terabyte. Solid state drive, on the other hand, are costlier, smaller, but they are far more faster. They're like 20 times faster than the hard disk drive. Okay, so in case your laptop is slow, you either increase the RAM or you increase you move to SSD. All right, so the fourth component that impacts the processing is the network card. What is a network card? Network card is something that, or you can say the network interface. Not only like LAN, it's also the Wi-Fi or other way you connect to the network. So since today, most of the computing depends on the network, invariably, you will end up reading data from somewhere and therefore network impacts the impacts a lot in processing all right let me put it another way so when cpu wants to do something some processing really quickly it generally stores data after reading from sdd reading from hard disk it stores in ram and from if the ram is not sufficient it will keep the data um, in the hard disk from time to time and it'll keep reading from there, right? So if RAM is smaller, then it has to do many trips in order to read from hard disk drive and therefore it'll be slower. So RAM size impacts the computing. Similarly, if the hard disk drive is full and we have stored our, our some of our data in a network computer, then the network bandwidth would come into play, okay? So, so basically, when we talk about big data, at least one of these on a computer become the bottleneck, either CPU, RAM, hard disk drive, or the network. Either of these become the bottleneck. And therefore, we need to move on to multiple computers in order to make it faster. All right, a quick question to all, which components impact the speed of computing, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Anyone? All right, those who are answering, I think they can answer to all instead of only the pan panelists. Is there an option to answer to all? Okay, great, yes. The answer is G because, the answer is G because, because if the memory size is low, then CPU will have to make more trips and therefore it'll be slow then if the memory read speed is slow, then further the processing is going to be slow. If the disk speed is, or disk size is slow, uh, disk speed is uh, less or disk size is less, then all again, the program will ta might take a long time and so on. So all of these impact the speed of computing. A question is how, good question, thank you, Prachir. Question is how disk size impacts the speed of computing. Imagine that your disk is smaller, so you end up end up moving the data to the network and eventually it'll be, your, your speed of computing will be slowed down because you're reading the data from the network, all right? So, I'm not saying that for every application, this will be the case. In general, all the components in the computer can impact the speed of computing, okay? So when your, your laptop is slow, it's not that you just have to upgrade it from uh, like uh, uh, more, more CPU, like better CPU, no. Generally, it'll be, generally it'll be a problem of something else. It's just a, because of the marketing of Intel or other, other CPU uh, companies, we, it, may, it makes us feel that only the CPU is the criteria for the faster. All right. 
Big data uses other systems to get the end objectives. So uh, big data is data. So it's us who is going to use it. And okay. So we'll have to use distributed computing in order to solve big data problems. Okay. Now, now till now we talked about there is a big data happening and there are so many so many problems with big data and 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 so on. The question is, what is the advantage of processing big data? A common uh, answer that I get is, hey, why do we need big data? We just sample the data and do our work. Why do we need to process the entire data? Or the other excuse, is, the, the other answer we I get is that uh, the older data is we kind of archive it. We just take our analysis, do our analysis on the recent, most recent data. Now, the answer to that question is, when you want to build really good insights, such as, let's say you want to build our recommendation engine. In case of Amazon, this is the page I owned. This, on this page that you see, this section is this one. It actually, the day we, started sending recommendations in the email to people, it actually improved the sales by around, by around 25%, okay? So why was it so? Because we were able to give really good recommendations, okay? As opposed to, as opposed to pushing what we want to sell, we started giving the rec great recommendations to the user. And then suddenly the users started trusting your website, you just started finding your website to be more and more useful. And that's the magic of recommendations. The better your recommendations are, the better will be the sales. Now, my question to you is, will smaller data give better recommendation or bigger data will give better recommendation? Yes. Thank you, Satyajit. So big, the more the data, the better will be the recommendation because, because the smaller data would have the voice of smaller population. The smaller data will represent, represent few users and there could be biases and so on, right? Therefore, therefore we need uh, we need uh, we need to process humongous data. All right. A question is: Can all of our mobile devices be used for big data processing? Yes. That's what is known as as computing, and people are working on it. Okay. But that's definitely a great idea. All right. So. Now, there are many forms of recommendations. One, people who bought this also bought this in which we don't have a clue about the current person. Second one is we are it with where we have no history of the users. So we basically create the custom recommendations. Then there are far more exhaustive recommendations such as the one with Netflix. Netflix actually was the pioneer of the recommendations in the sense that they started a competition like Kaggle on which there was a $1 million prize on coming up with the recommendation algorithm. Okay, so so basically they, their recommendation engine is really, really good. Okay, so if you, if you are more interested, just search for Netflix $1 million uh, prize. Okay, you will get the full detail about that. So that was a long back around 2012 or 11. And um, every recommendation, uh, so, so recommendation engines are very, very useful when it comes to e-commerce or any other system. You will see that recommendation engine was the first one to be used uh, was the first reason why people started adopting the big data platforms such as Hadoop. Now, how do we do the recommendation? If you want to know, the, it, it's not too complicated work because today most of the complex work is hidden in these software packages such as Spark ML Lib. This package provides you the the recommendation out of the box. In simple words, 
recommendation is generally mapping the users with respect to their similarity. So this one, let's say there is a, if you are able to frame your data in the form of user ID, movie ID and rating, right? If you can frame it this way, you can simply feed it to Spark and Spark will generate the recommendation that this is your user, this is your movie and this is the rating. So Spark MLLib, I'm just taking extremely simplistic case. We specify that this is the product, this is, sorry, this is the user, this is the product and this is the rating out of five and Spark MLLib will generate the, generate the recommendations. All right. All right. Okay, a question from uh, someone from IBM is that how, how are we using that? All right, so I think you can come over to our discussion forum. Okay, so we have a very vibrant discussion forum. You can actually come over there. I'll just open it once. So if you go to our website, cloudxlab.com, here you have resources and under resources we have forum this is a very popular forum and people use it so here please post your questions and i would love to answer okay and uh, yeah okay so here uh, you will also find like forum blog and and, and like free courses so, so feel free to sign up with CloudX Lab. You will find a lot of free courses as well as free resources. Also, we provide the lab, uh, the, 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 the cluster for free for one week to everyone and one month for anybody who is from educational background. Okay, so so those who are in have the email ID of their college, they can they can take a lab for a month and other for everyone it's free for one week okay so those are the free free things that cloudx lab runs in order to in order to help people get up and running with processing of big data all right wonderful set of questions moving ahead so this is how i'm just giving you a really high high uh high yeah, what do you say high level overview of the recommendations Moving ahead, the second use case that basically, this is one thing that, again, uh, my experience with A-B testing at Amazon was e-commerce, okay? Uh, at Amazon was A-B testing, we used to call it web lab. So A-B testing comes from the background like um, the the, pharma kind of background whereby you test the drugs, right? You test, test the drugs and you compare the results. Similar, similar approach has been adopted in case of the, e the large scale e-commerce platforms. Now, if you have big data, if you have many users coming in, then you can utilize the statistics in order to measure which feature is doing better. Like for example, here, there are two variations of your website. Variation A is red and variation B is green. Both variations are being shown to 50% users coming to your website, right? My question to all of you is that if you have to choose, if you have to decide whether to go with variation A or variation B, which one will you choose? Yes? A or B? A, right? Because A is giving better conversion. So let the data help you take the decisions. When you have a lot of data, a lot of data, a lot of users, you will be able to take the decisions regarding the product based on the data, right? And this is exactly what we, I, I enjoyed at Amazon that we, we actually run hundreds of, uh, hundreds of A-B test, test case on amazon.com. If you don't believe me, open amazon.com in different, different browsers on different machines, you will be able to notice the differences between the two. All right, so we continuously 
run the a b testing and that's how that's how amazon basically improves incrementally okay so it, since handling a b testing is a big data job because, because the more the data the better is a b testing and therefore therefore a b testing has proved really useful in e-commerce in the other verticals such as government for fraud detection by going through the by going through a person's data in the background or transactions in the background understanding the behavior and so on so that's another use case of big data in the government similarly cybersecurity welfare analyzing large scale of data to 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 come up with the patterns which looks like threat is again um, the use case of big data in government big data could be used or processed in order to have a fair justice by having like being having the capability of indexing large scale of documents getting the feedback from large scale of community and so on right that's the government and the in telecom telecommunication the customer churn prevention is a very common example second is the network performance optimization network performance optimization is a very big problem to solve in case of telecoms and you will be amazed to know how much how much work goes there okay like for example in one of the projects that came to us in which they were basically maintaining the configuration of every com every hardware component on in each of the towers and they were observing which hardware change impacts the maximum in terms of the productivity okay so that network performance optimization is a big domain in telecom along with customer churn prevention uh, or or stopping the customer from leaving you and calling data record analysis meaning you want to analyze the calling record calling data record so that if there is a threat you can upfront uh, upfront upfront get alerted similarly analyzing network to predict failures if you have this again fourth problem again uh, somebody had come to me uh, once to you know analyze humongous data in order to predict the network failure what they wanted was that if there is a failure in the network you should be alerted so analyzing network to predict failure is a common common uh, problem that most of the telecom solve using big data okay in healthcare and life sciences in healthcare and life sciences almost everything is big data health information exchange gene sequencing healthcare improvements and drug safety all of these problems are big data problems because in healthcare probably everything is humongous data right a question from fahim is is analyzing network applicable to predict machine failures yes that's again a common use case and this again has uh, when i was talking about just now the problem th there we were predicting the equipment failure failure uh, based on the, based on the network behavior okay so being able to predict the equipment failure is a big big use case of big data all right now the okay now that was the those were the use cases i've just given a very high level overview now the there are many big data solutions out there the first one and the one that we are going to get into is the a combination of hadoop and spark hadoop for generally storage and spark for processing the second model is having no sequel kind of installations like cassandra mongodb they all are distributed components so cassandra and mongodb can run using hundreds of computers and can do the work parallelly 
while while the cloud solutions like google compute engine or aws they are the hosted solution for that you will have to upload your data onto their cloud and also it would cost you more money as compared to setting up your own cluster but if you are using somebody else's cloud the hardware problems are not your problems okay so these are the various ways to solve your big data problems either you set up your hadoop and spark cluster at your own or set it up at aws or use cassandra or mongodb use google compute engine you know, aws inbuilt features to set up to do the distributed computing okay so generally Generally, the Google Compute Engine or AWS uh, in an organization, some of the data people ship to these uh, third party cloud providers, some of the data they do it internally. A question is, is Cassandra alternative to Hadoop storage wise? So since Cassandra is like a database on which we can write queries, a lot of work can be done, but if your data is an unstructured and you want to keep a lot of unstructured data, then Cassandra may not be the best choice. Cassandra provides a way to do the processing using Cassandra query language, but it's not as, as great as using Spark because in Spark you have a lot of libraries and software packages which do really sophisticated sophisticated tasks okay though you can read the data from cassandra into spark but again for that you will have to have spark along with cassandra okay great set of questions so moving ahead now that was about the various big data solutions All right. A question from Aksham is semi structured data in short intro which packages can handle it? Good question. So almost every package tries to handle it in one way or another, but most of the NoSQLs, you will have to uh, first convert your uh, unstructured data or semi-structured data into something a bit more structured format. Also, most of the NoSQLs such as Cassandra, MongoDB, they're comfortable with storing semi-structured data, okay? All right. The other question is from Prasant. If we go for cloud provider like AWS, how about the data security? If you go for cloud provider like uh, AWS, how about the, the security? Good question. So um, most of these cloud providers provide a data security guarantee and data safety as well as data security both. But since the data is in their premises, they still have access to your data. All right. Okay, a question is, can you give a brief description of Google Compute Engine and um, is it alternative to others listed? So Google Compute Engine or AWS are competitors. AWS is Amazon Web Services, and they provide all kinds of solutions. Using Google Compute Engine, you could have all kinds of solutions like running a program on their platform or uh, installing Hadoop and Spark, installing Cassandra and MongoDB at Google Compute Engine or AWS, that both can be done, okay? So, so basically, it's 
uh, as in Google Compute Engine provides all kind of functionalities, just like Amazon Web Services. Okay, a question from Nana, Nana is, give some introduction about MongoDB, please. MongoDB is like a data store, right? Like your MySQL or Microsoft or other data store databases, just that MongoDB runs parallelly on multiple computers, okay? So, and they, instead of calling it a table, they call it a collection. And every row, instead of being a row, it's a big, large ob object. It's a complex object. And this collection is divided on multiple computers. MongoDB provides a query language so that you can query these collections, or you can say tables, in the form of aggregations or MapReduce. That's kind of the brief introduction I can give you about MongoDB. Okay, so MongoDB has its own election mechanism and so on. All right, you can take a look at our, our YouTube channel. You'll find a lot of material on the MongoDB. Okay, so moving ahead. All right. The next question is, what is Hadoop? Hadoop is basically a software that was created by Doc Cutting, who was working in Yahoo at that point of time. They were trying to build a search engine called Notch. They were, it was kind of a personal project and and he was joined by Mike Caffarella and they were struggling. They were struggling with, with storing humongous data. Writing a crawler was very easy, but, but coming up with the huge storage was something really, really impossible at that point of time. So lucky for them that Google came along and Google published their design of file system, their design of processing engine called Google MapReduce, and they also published the third paper called Google Bigtable. All right, so Google Bigtable became the Hadoop's uh, structured storage, while Google MapReduce became Hadoop's MapReduce, and Google File System became Hadoop's file system. So Doc Cutting and Mike Caprilla, they implemented these three papers, and that's what became Hadoop. All right, so Hadoop started with three components and later on it became the full umbrella of softwares. Okay, so it was named after Toy Elephant and it is an open source project. Now this is important. So why Hadoop became popular is because it was having one of the most liberal licenses is called Apache license. Okay, so Apache is more like a license or is a, is basically an umbrella term, though Apache also started as a software. There was one Apache web server that became the de facto standard of entire World Wide Web, and that was open source, and it was basically the most used web server on the across the globe. Okay, so So basically, the reason of Hadoop's popularity was that it was open source and that too, very liberal license with Apache license. Hadoop is popular, powerful, and supported, okay? It doesn't mean that if it is open source, it is going to be abandoned and nobody's going to use it. It's not like that. It's actually far more popular and well supported by various companies. Okay, it's a framework to handle big data. Now, the last one is something I would like to describe. It's a framework to handle big data. It is for distributed, scalable, and reliable computing. What is distributed? Getting the work done using many com computers. Scalable meaning, today we have 100 machines, tomorrow if we have 200 machines, our software should not have a problem. It should just 
scale to fit so many machines. And reliable computing, what is reliable computing? When something fails down, something breaks down, it should not break the computing. If let's say the network, some, some of the machines go down and you're doing some processing, it should not break. That's reliable computing. So all of the components today under the umbrella of Hadoop must have these three characteristics. They should be distributed, they should be scalable, and they should be reliable. The fifth one is Hadoop was written in Java so that it can run everywhere. Now, a question from S. Williams is, can we call Hadoop as a platform service? So uh, it's basically a platform, not as a service. You can just host it on AWS and call it platform as a service. You can call CloudX Lab as platform as a service, but we're using Hadoop on the cluster, okay? Hadoop is a software that runs on many computers in order to solve humongous data problems, okay? So that's ex exactly what Hadoop is. Hadoop is suite of components. It's a suite of components, a collection of components which come together, that, which are designed for distributed, scalable, and reliable computing. All right? Is everybody with me so far? A question from Satyajit is, so to learn Hadoop, do we need to know Java? Not really. It's written in Java. That does not mean that it can cannot be used using any other programming language. For me, when I started with Hadoop in 2012, January, so, so that point of time, uh, I was very comfortable with Java. And when I looked at all the APIs of Hadoop, I found that I found that uh, it's far more easier to just use it using Python. So, so I was using, I learned Python and, uh, and then, then, then worked on Hadoop and got my rec reconciler engine done on 200 terabyte data. And that's what, that was a very, very important step. Okay, so, so, so essentially, essentially you can use any programming language not alone at Java. A question from S. William is, um, but to work as a big data engineer, we need to know either Scala, Java, or Python, right? This is what it makes it complicated. So a uh, good point. So my, my suggestion generally to everyone is that make yourself com comfortable with at least one programming language, no matter whether you are an artist, whether you are um, into construction, or you are into music, make yourself comfortable in a language like Python. Trust me, it makes a lot of difference. That's why I actually ran a, a, a boot camp, um, a, a large boot, free boot camp in which we taught Python. So, so the idea is, whichever field you are in, the programming is going to help you. Okay, so my suggestion generally is just get yourself comfortable with Python because that's easiest to learn. And it's not that you're going to miss anything. You can get everything done using Python, whether it's Hadoop, Spark or anything. Okay. So, so yes, generally in big data engineer, people do have this requirement that people, the engineers should know the, at least one programming language. Okay. So it's not it's not uh, difficult. It's actually pretty easy, and I have taught to many people, so I uh, I know that it, you will be able to easily handle it. A question from Parul is that how to implement Hadoop for any organization from the scratch? Good question, Parul. So the first thing to know, do is uh, first thing to do is understand in an organization that they want to go with a hosted model or they want to go for local model, okay? And if they want to go for local as in on-premise model, then basically buy good set of computers, okay? And it's not necessary to buy really high-end computers. You can just buy very average computers and get the installation done, okay? Just that these couple of steps would require a lot of um, discussions with, uh, with a lot of permissions with people because they'll have to give the permission to install Hadoop, okay? 
But the good part is, very good part is this. You don't need to buy the license of Hadoop for anything. Okay, Hadoop is Apache open source. So that one permission is gone. Second, to start with, you don't need to buy too much of hardware. So you can just start with say, three computers in the beginning. So you just have to acquire three computers. And once that starts working fine, then you can keep on scaling up as and when required. That also will basically, uh, if you want to push your organization that, hey, I want to um, set up my Hadoop cluster here, it's very much needed. You need to just explain them to them that, hey, these are the use cases and this, the, this is the kind of processing we can done, can be done at a very low cost and so on. So all of that, if we can make, you can build a case, you can generally get the work going, okay? Also, it's always uh, wise to have one Linux administrator involved in the Hadoop installation. Okay, installing Hadoop is extremely straightforward if somebody is coming from a bit Linux background. And if you want to make yourself in Linux, uh, comfortable with Linux, feel free to um, go through my Linux tutorial. I've written in a hands-on way in which it'll ask you to do various things in the lab using Linux commands, and then it'll give you the, the reward. All right, great set of questions. Okay, so in your organization, you have to figure out who basically takes care of the, the hardware acquisitions, hardware, um, acquiring the hardware from the vendors and so on. All right, so that's the point I was trying to make. Did I make sense to you? All right. All of you will get the recording of this session along with this presentation, so do not worry. But in case you want to blog about it or, or you want to take screenshots, please feel free to do so, okay? I mean, there's nothing much of a copyright as long as you are just mentioning that it is from CloudWorks Lab, okay? So, all right. Now, that was a brief introduction of, of Hadoop. Okay, a question is, can you explain the point number D? So Hadoop, when they were trying to implement, they realized that it will be impossible to store the World Wide Web's data on a single computer or using any of the existing platform. So they were kind of stuck, but lucky for them, Google published these three papers. Okay, those papers are legendary. And in case you are a researcher or a, a engineer who wants to understand in great details, go through those three papers, okay? Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gamawat, I think those two guys and a couple of more have published these three papers, Google File System, Google MapReduce, and Google Bigtable. Based on these three, three papers, Hadoop's first three components were implemented, all right? Great. So, a question is, are the Java API faster than Python APIs? So the answer is yes. Java APIs are faster than Python APIs, definitely. But you will be amazed to know that when we deal with big data, that fastness because of the language does not matter too much. What matters more is how well you are able to distribute your computing amongst the various computers, all right? So the way, the way uh, we generally do things is, the first version of the product, we do it quick and fast, quick and get it done dirty. In that case, we are completely okay with Python. So first, we, first problem that we solve is, let's get our work distributed amongst many computers because that's the first objective. Once that is achieved, then replicating the same work in Java is, is very straightforward, all right? It's very straightforward. Or let it be in Python or, or let it be in uh, any of the languages, it would not make much of a difference if your data is big, okay? 
A question is, how about memory utilization? Would we need to give more memory to Python to perform the same task? Not much. It's actually very insignificant. Most of the tasks, if they are consuming more memory, anyway, they'll be kicked out whether they are using in Java or Python. But that difference may be, let's say, 10% or 20% extra. But but that, that, that that's not the big concern. The big concern generally when we are processing big data is that we end up loading a lot of data into memory. And that's why Hadoop's design has been such that it doesn't like, it doesn't want you to load anything in the memory. Okay, we will learn that part uh, when we talk about processing. We talk about examples, very simple examples like word counting, computing the frequency of words. Then you realize that the most important part is changing the approach rather than changing the programming language. Okay. Great, great set of questions. A couple of more questions and then we'll take a break. A question from Parul is that for installing Hadoop in our distributed network, how can we do it? And to do the configuration and attach with the data, say big data. All right, all right. So I think the question is really big and uh, it would require me, uh, require a lot of uh, details. So why don't you come over to the discussion forum? We already have uh, created a two and a half hours video to demonstrate how to install Hadoop using Ambari and using Hortonworks and Cloud Data Platform. The way we have set up our Cloud X lab in the same way, we have made it public and published on our blog. So you can take a look at that. Okay, so all of this de these details are mentioned there. All right. Now, there are something called Hadoop distribution. So various companies, specifically the people who contributed to Hadoop, they started their companies, they started their organizations to support Hadoop professionally, right? One of them, uh, earlier it started by Cloudera and then Hortonworks also contributed a lot to the development of Hadoop. And that's why Hortonworks data platform is one of the packages that basically have Hadoop in it. So Hadoop is Apache open source and Hortonworks data platform is basically a bundle of Hadoop, the core Hadoop, plus some bells and whistles, such as Ambari and other components. So that's by, this is by a company called Hortonworks, okay? Hortonworks ships Hadoop as part of their Hortonworks data platform, okay? So it contains Hadoop and Spark, which is Apache license, then Ambari, which is for provisioning and, uh, and Ambari also provides a way of monitoring and installing new things and providing a workbench. Second is the Cloudera. There's another company called Cloudera. Cloudera also provides its own data platform, which basically bundle of software that has Hadoop and Spark combined together. And there is something called Cloudera Manager, which basically help you install the Cloudera softwares. Uh, that, which helps you install Hadoop and other components. Cloudera also provides a nice workbench called Hue using which you can interact. So, and what we have done at CloudX Lab is, is that we started with Hortonworks and then we added extra components from Cloudera. Okay, then third component is Mapar. Mapar is essentially another company called Mapar okay, which is not like same MapReduce as Hadoop MapReduce we'll talk about, but it's a different company which provides the support for Hadoop, okay? All right, so these are the various companies that provide the distributions. Okay, if you are going for home hosting, you might want to go for Microsoft. It uses SD Insights. It has an ex it can, it is extensible to use with .NET along with Java. If you are on Amazon EC2 or S3, you can take a look at this video uh, using this. Okay, this is one I was talking about. All right, I'm just going to share this with all of you. So so this is the one that we have uh, given to 
to the users and uh, so that they can install. Now on Amazon Elastic MapReduce, uh, you, could, you can also install, okay, let me go back here. So first is on Amazon, uh, on Microsoft Azure using SD Insights, okay? Second one is using Amazon EC2 services. Here, basically, we have to install the Hadoop and so on, right? While there is a version of uh, MapReduce, a way of programming, is provided by Amazon Elastic MapReduce. In that case, you don't have to install. There's no need of installing any Hadoop or Spark. You can simply run your job, whatever you were running locally, you can submit it to Amazon Elastic MapReduce. Okay, that basically great for transferring the data between EC2 and S3, right? It also provides Apache Hive in the same way. It supports for spot instances. Spot instances in case of AWS is something that basically you can instantaneously acquire and it would disappear. These are really low cost instances. Or you could do the same thing, whatever you did on Amazon, you could do the same thing on Google's cloud platform, okay? So, so basically, this is how you could host it on the cloud. Hive, we will talk about. Hive is basically a way of pro computing or processing your data using SQL. And internally, the work is divided into many computers. Okay, a question from Venkat is, in real time, what could be the volume of data daily daily banks or telecom companies, all right? It all depends. Some of these companies have ter terabytes of data per day, okay? So it all depends and I don't have exact numbers, but the telecom companies which I've interacted with, they have far more data and have hu humongous information per day, okay? A question from Inder is, can you please give an introduction to AWS Elastic MapReduce? I'll talk about MapReduce in the next, uh, uh, in the next slide. And then that'll be, I'll be talking about, I'll be talking about MapReduce uh, very soon. So do not worry that at that point of time, things will be very clear. Okay, great. Let's take a break for 10 minutes and we'll be back by break for, 10 minutes, back by 9.43 p.m. IST. All right, so let's start. Great, great. Hi everyone, are you able to hear me and see my screen clearly? Okay, can you see my cursor moving? Great, great to have all of you in the session. Wonderful set of questions. Keep the questions coming and also please fill the uh, fill your uh, feedback as shared, shared. Okay, all right. So, <clears throat> great. Wonderful to have all of you in the session. So before the break, we were talking about how to host Hadoop, which solutions to use and so on. And uh, the decision of picking up Microsoft versus Amazon versus Google will be, or, or keeping it your own hosted is going to be a tough decision. It'll be basically based on the opinions of various stakeholders, all right? And uh, the only thing you can do is, you can do is you can um, keep, a uh, uh, vision clarity with respect to the costs of each of these platforms as well as the services provided by them. Okay, uh, a question from Charlotte is that are spot instances like a sample data set? No, spot instances are like computers that are made available to you at very low cost by Amazon. Right, so what you do is you bid for a particular instance and in case your bid wins, you will get the spot instance and Amazon can basically take it back anytime it needs. 
it'll just give you an R of window. Therefore, these instances are like uh, really cheap, but they are uh, not great for a permanent systems like your web server, right? If you want to host your website, never host it on spot instance because Amazon might take it back if somebody else needs it, okay? But they will give you some one hour of notice, okay? So that's called spot instance. All right, great, great set of questions and uh, moving ahead. Now the very important part is to understand the ecosystem of various components in Hadoop. The most important component is something called Zookeeper, okay? Zookeeper is something that is an unsung hero of the entire Hadoop ecosystem because this component is like um, a tiny database, but it is highly available service using which all of the components communicate with each other. Okay, for example, HDFS high availability uses Zookeeper and, uh, and, and uh, even non-Hadoop components such as, such as Kafka, they all use Zookeeper. So Zookeeper is basically a component that is required for Hadoop, though it is not part of Hadoop ecosystem. Okay, so Zookeeper is used, is like a database. It runs in the network on many computers simultaneously, and many users can use this service in order to in order to keep tiny bit of information, specifically in information related to coordination that, hey, I'm processing this, you don't process that. So that kind of information is generally kept in the Zookeeper. Now that was the first component. Now the, the most fundamental component in case of Hadoop is the Hadoop file system. Just like in your computer, you have C colon, or if you're on Mac, you have your folder structure locally if that you see on your Mac, you can see the, in the finder that that's basically the file system in on your, your computer. So on your computer, if the file system is not there, nothing will start, right? So similarly in the Hadoop ecosystem, we have Hadoop distributed file system. That's the core of Hadoop. Everybody relies upon Hadoop file system. Okay, yes. A question from Rajat is, uh, yes, we are talking about Hadoop too. All right, so, and so Hadoop file system is something that stores, Hadoop file system is something that stores the data in the form of files and folders. You can create files and folders and you can keep them. I'll give you a quick overview. If you, let me just close this window. And also, okay, I'm going to uh, just give you a very um, quick look at the components, okay? And yeah, before we go to various components, I think a better idea is that as I walk you through the components, I'll also show how to use that in CloudX Lab, okay? It's a bit technical, so, I'm hoping that you will be okay with that, all right? So if you go to my lab, you will see your login and password, and you have MySQL credentials, and you have the IP mappings, okay? A question from Lakshmi is, are we going to cover Spark today? We're going to cover the basic ecosystem of Spark today, and uh, this pretty much will be there today, all right? So if you have already attended this session, you can uh, you can join next Saturday, and we will continue. We'll continue from recap, and then okay. Now moving ahead. So what you see here is okay. So when you take a subscription of CloudX Lab or you take up a course, you generally get the lab credentials. And uh, you can uh, get the lab free by referring people as well. And here, what we have is the general instructions. So 
here what you see is there are these components one is ambari hue web console and jupiter jupiter you would generally require when you want to interact uh, with, with in the python and you want to do more of data science or machine learning work console you will require whenever you want to interact with the linux system hue you will require when you want to interact with hadoop ambari if you want to administer or provision or install in that case you uh, you will need Ambari. Ambari and Hue are strictly for Hadoop ecosystem. So I'll show you that uh, how does Ambari looks like. Ambari comes from Hortonworks data platform and Ambari helps us installing the Hadoop ecosystem in the cluster. Okay. All right, it's asking to log in and I click on login. So I've logged in into admin. So these are the various services that you see. Okay, these are the various services that have been installed and these are the various hosts that are currently active. Okay, these are the various hosts that are currently active. Okay. Right. So these are the various hosts that are active and what you see here is the various component installed by Ambari. Now, the second uh, second software that we'll use often in case of the course is, is a tool called um, Hue. Using Hue, you can interact with the services of Hadoop. Okay, these are the various services that we have installed. We'll talk about each of them one at a time. We talked about Zookeeper. You can see Zookeeper server is running on many computers simultaneously. This one is on one, this is another, and so on. There are four instances of Zookeeper running, and they are talking to each other, providing you a single, single store to keep the information. Okay, now this is Hue. Hue provides us a way to interact with Hadoop file system. Okay, so you can see this is the Hadoop file system. Okay, this is the Hadoop file system. All right, you can see it has folders, it has files and so on. These are files and folders. If you want to upload some to, something to Hadoop, you can just click on upload and, and that's all. So the important part is that this looks like the normal file system in case of Linux, right? This looks like a normal file system in case of Linux, right? So here, Every every user gets their home drive in which they can keep their data stored, and uh, and they can also take a look at the common data store uh, that we have created so that people can process the the common data. Like here, there is a Chicago crime data, there is a NYSE data, then there is a sentiment analysis, Twitter sentiments data, and there is there is Flume, there is Funme. Uh, uh, there is uh, this is from one of the uh, users, uh, one of the professors, and this is uh, for uh, various uh, organizations who are using. This is movie lens data. This is for processing unstructured data. So we have all kinds of central data located in HDFS. Now coming back to uh, the coming back to HDFS from the user perspective, HDFS looks like a file system, just like another. Okay. All right, okay, uh, no worries, Satyajit. And a question from Ajay is, is cluster size depends on the size of the data. What is the average cluster size? Good question, good question. So cluster planning includes how much copies of data do you want, how much data you're going to keep, and accordingly, you decide the cluster size. Yes, the th general thumb rule is how much data are we going to store and what kind of processing are we going to do? do? That's going to be the main uh, defining criteria. Yes, Satyaji, somebody has raised a hand. Okay. A question from 
green is that I see bytes of data in the file system. Is this uh, discouraged overkill? Uh, yes, of course. If these these kind of files are overkill, we learn, learn we, 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 you can learn uh, this part if you go through the Hadoop HDFS file system uh, details, you will learn that these, these are not great. These are overkill. All right. Now, a, a question is how you using components by different vendors to gather Hue Cloudera Ambari Hortonworks? Yes, we have. That's one thing that we have done. We have made sure that we could use the components from various parties because at the end of day, at the end of day, the data engineers or data architects should be comfortable from both comfortable with both the offerings. And hence we have created, we have installed both of them. There were difficulties in installation, but we figured out ways around it. All right. Great. Now moving ahead. So that was a glimpse of what is a file system. Right. So Hadoop file system is the file system on which the entire ecosystem depends. Now we need something like an operating system which can monitor what's going on in the cluster in the background. This that's what is yarn. Yarn is yet another resource manager. If you want to run a program on computers in the cluster, you ask Yarn to do it. Yarn keeps track of which machine is free, which machine is busy, and which machine is running, how many applications, and so on. Yarn keeps track of the resource management in the cluster. Anything to do with the storage is the duty of Hadoop, Hadoop file system. Anything to do with, with running programs is the duty of Yarn. Afterwards, uh, so generally you as a developer do not interact with Yarn much. You basically to take a look at, okay, how many jobs are running and so on. The way you don't program for an operating system in the same way you don't really program for Yarn. Now, on top of Yarn, there is a very flexible framework called MapReduce. Map MapReduce was the pioneer, uh, I mean, one, one component that basically made the distributed compute, computing easy and possible for everyone. So using MapReduce, you, you, can, you will have to design your logic, your program such that your program contains map to two pieces of code, map and reduce, and then you bundle it together, hand it over to MapReduce framework, and MapReduce framework will run your mappers on many machines, and then once the result is achieved, it will run the reducers. So uh, right now, I'm just giving details. Even if you did not understand this part, that's completely okay. Just that understand that MapReduce is a framework of computation. Map, MapReduce is used by many other softwares. And what we essentially do is we, the way we write our group by clauses, similar, like we write select queries, in the similar way, we design our Map and Reduce program and hand it over to MapReduce. If you have already the programs, you can use MapReduce streaming. That is also good enough, okay? Now, the second component is uh, Spark. Spark is a competitor to MapReduce. Spark is, you can say that Spark is fast more, far more faster than MapReduce. The main difference between Spark and Hadoop, uh, Hadoop MapReduce was, Spark was designed with the perspective that it could utilize memory whenever needed. But that does not mean that Spark is going to consume entire memory. It's going to consume entire memory because uh, bec uh, that's not true. Spark will consume the memory which is available. So difference between MapReduce and Spark is MapReduce tend not to keep anything in the memory it tries to avoid as much as possible while Spark, Spark utilizes memory, memory RAM of your computer whenever required. So Spark is faster MapReduce and far more easier to program. And that's why we have reduced the, we have brought the MapReduce portion in our courses down to very small size, but we've increased the 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 course uh, the, the the portion of the spark in our courses 
to a larger extent. So we are going to focus more on Spark. All right. Now, there is something called NoSQL data source, such as HBase. HBase stores the data in the form of rows and, and columns, while file system was storing the data in the form of files and folders. Here, HBase is storing the data in the form, form of rows and columns, and you can modify the data as and when you want. But if you are modifying the data in the file system, it's going to going to recreate the file, and hence, it's going to be far more inefficient. So HBase, even though at the end of day, HBase stores the data in the file system, but HBase provides you a way of storing data in the form of rows and columns, right? You can think of HBase like a big spreadsheet, right? Which has columns and rows, and you can keep on adding columns and, and rows at any point of time. Similarly, you can do the same thing in HBase, and you just you'll have to use the command line instead of a beautiful user interface like Excel sheet, okay? So HBase is a, is a storage which provides you the format of rows and columns to store data, right? Just like Excel sheet are at the end of day stored in the file system. Similarly, HBase's data at the end of day actually kept in the Hadoop distributed file system. Okay. A question is, what is the difference between Yarn and MapReduce? Yarn is a generic framework, just like an operating system and and a processing engine. That's the difference between Yarn and MapReduce. Yarn is a operating system kind of model, which, you just, which will just keep track of which machine is doing what and how to run a program where. That's the role of Map Yarn. While MapReduce is a framework, which also does the sorting of data. Both MapReduce and Spark provides the, the distributed sorting algorithm that you can utilize. Okay, so that's where they basically first MapReduce won the sorting benchmark, which is basically a competition where various various softwares compete for sorting, sorting humongous data. First MapReduce won, then Spark won. Okay. Then since writing MapReduce was a little bit more um, involving and we had to do write a write lot, of, lot of code, there came a software called Hive. Hive basically lets you write or express your logic in the form of SQL query. And when you write that, it's basically going to ask MapReduce to, to run the maps and reduce. It will basically internally convert your SQL into MapReduce and those MapReduces will be executed on the yarn okay so so basically map reuse get executed on yarn spark get executed on yarn and many other similar systems are executed on yarn okay so similar to hive there is something called pig and pig latin so pig is a uh, similar to hive which converts pig latin into map reduce so this is very much similar to sql they came up with their own own sql like language which was designed for distributed computing so that you can you can process humongous data here so there is hive and there is big latin okay they both are competitors people don't use this anymore people are mostly using either hive or people are using spark even the use of map reduce has gone down drastically okay now there was this framework called Mahath. Mahath has also is also shifting to Spark. Earlier, Mahath used to be on MapReduce. What is Mahath? Mahath is a collection of libraries for doing the high-end computing, such as machine learning and statistics. So you can think of Mahath as a software package that contains all the libraries, that contains the, the machine learning libraries and statistical analysis libraries. Okay? That's what is Mahath. Now, when you have a larger project, like a big project in a company, you generally would have some work here, some work here, some work here, some work here, and so on. And therefore, you would need something called a workflow engine. Okay? Okay? You would not need a workflow engine. You would need a workflow engine if you are executing larger project. Okay? So, a question from uh, S. Williams is that if I use Hive queries, 
high vesicle queries it is converted to the map reduce if i use spark then it is not converted to map reduce rather spark has a different way of distributing data correct so spark has its own way of processing instead of using map reduce it has its own mechanisms of processing though it also has terms like map and reduces but it's not the same Okay, so a question from Green is that I think that because Hadoop has minimum block size of 128 MB or so, so even a file which is in bytes of data would actually not really. Okay, a question. This is a very common um, myth that in case we have a very small file, it's going to consume 128 megabyte space. No, it it will consume only those few bytes. The only challenge there is when you have too many files, then the the data of data, as in the information of all the files, be, keeps on becoming bigger and bigger. All right, that's why we don't encourage the uh, too many small files, right? So again, those who are not aware about the Hadoop file system here, Hadoop file system lets you break down the data into, uh, uh, sorry, Hadoop file system, provides the storage by combining many computers. If you have 1000 computers and those 1000 computers have, each one of them is having say two terabyte data. So that will provide you two petabyte of storage. Okay, and it basically cuts the files into a fixed size blocks like 128 MB. Generally, the last block is lesser, lesser. So the point I'm trying to make is in case your file is smaller, it's going to not, it's not going to consume the entire block, okay? It's going to consume only that block, all right? Those who are coming from HDFS background, they would know that. All right, a common myth is that in case you're st storing a small file, it's still going to consume 128 MB, all right? That's what I was cl clarifying. Okay, good question, very good question. Moving ahead. A question is, um, If I use Hive SQL queries, it is converted to MapReduce. Yeah, this I think I have answered. Is there any question that I have missed? Please use Q&A window. That becomes easier for me so that I can track which one I have answered and not. Okay. Great, great. Let me walk you through. Uh, let me walk you through the uh, 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 standard use case of a component called Uzi. Uzi is a workflow engine. Okay. Okay, so imagine that you want to build a recommendation engine. Okay, let's say your organization comes with an idea that they will build a recommender system. What is a recommender system? Just like Amazon e-commerce. Amazon uh, recommendations, you want to give recommendations to your user based on the, the history of other users, right? So a classic example here is, let's say, all right, one more thing I forgot to tell you here. There are these two components one is called Flume and Scoop. They are for bringing data to Hadoop from the traditional sources. Using a Scoop, you can bring the data from the databases. Using Flume, you can bring the unstructured data to the Hadoop file system. And Flume basically keeps running forever instead of stopping. Okay, so Flume keeps on pumping the data continuously into the file system and Flume is used to aggregate a lot of data in your organization at a central place. Okay, so using Flume, people pump the data from all over and store it in HDFS. Sometimes HDFS, there is a term called data, la data lake. Sometimes the data lakes are created using Hadoop file system. Data Lake is a central place in an organization where everybody keeps their data, all right? So that's what is Hadoop distributed file system. 
so that's what is Flume. Flume keeps on pumping data from all these sources into Hadoop file system, while Scoop keeps on. Scoop helps us copying the data from the traditional data sources such as a database. It lets you copy the data from there to here. This is far more efficient, and of course, you can write your own program to do it. But this one is far more efficient. Okay, now let me walk you through our recommendation engine. So initially, let's say you have a website using Flume, you will keep on pumping the data to HDFS continuously from your web server. Your web server is basically generating the logs. What is a log? Log is the information about all the actions that have taken place on the server when user has accessed the website. So the information about which all which all actions have happened when the user access the website is called basically a log entry. So using logs, you want to generate the recommendation. So first of all, you will use a Flume agent, which will keep on pumping that data from web server to Hadoop file system. And from Hadoop file system, periodically, you will run either your Hive queries, Pig queries, or Spark queries, and you will clean the data and keep it Keep it here in HDFS. And once you're done, then using a tool like machine learning library from Spark, you will generate the recommendations. Afterwards, using the scoop-like tool, you will carry these recommendations to the traditional data source, such as MySQL, from where it will be catered to the user. So the recommendations will be served by the web server to the end user. And this is called a workflow. These things need to be done periodically every day and can be done using Uzi workflow. All right, I hope the example of Uzi is clear to all of you that when we want to build a recommendation engine, this is what happens. All right, so those who missed that uh, here, so you can run MapReduce using Hadoop commands. I'll just show you that part so you can, okay. So here you can click on uh, console and log in into console by copying the password. Okay, I'm just copy pasting my password. Here using Hadoop jar, you can run your MapReduce programs, okay. I don't have a good example right now. Okay, let me just see if I could come up. All right. This is an example of uh, running the MapReduce program. You are saying Hadoop jar, this is the package that contains your, uh, contains uh, the, the MapReduce and here you are passing the commands and so on. If you want to run it, you can try at your time. All right. Great, so that's the example of Hadoop, Hadoop and Produce. Then you have Hadoop, you can interact with file system and so on. If you want to interact with Hive, you can type Hive here, or you could go to Hue and click on, click on Query Editor and click on Hive. That will open the Query Editor, all right? That way you can interact with Hive. Okay, so this is the, it's going to show you the Hive editor. So here Hive text editor is the place where you can write your queries, okay? So which other component did we miss? Let me walk you through. So here you can write your queries the way I've written my, my SQL query. So this is the query that I'm running and it will going to give us the outcome by, by running the MapReduce under the hood. Okay, this will basically utilize multiple computers to give you give you the results. Okay, so I, this is just to give you um, a taste of what it looks like to work with Hive. If you want to work with uh, Pig, you can just type Pig here on the console and it will show up the Pig. Okay, so this is the place where you will type the Pig commands. All right. All right, I'm just walking you through really 
you know at a very high level ideally we spend good enough time and in case you want to let's say spark then i'll show you the spark part and rest of the things you can handle you can create the uzi workflow from the hue editor okay so you can do that from probably somewhere here okay yeah from here you can run the workflows you can drag and drop and create the workflow uh, of create this kind of workflow okay by dragging various components and creating the the sequence of activities all right so that was a quick overview of uh, how the various components look like i'll just walk you through the spark but before that let me answer your questions okay a question is um, isn't hadoop good at handling small files too uh, it's not because it consumes a lot of memory if uh, because of the metadata a small file and big file both have uh, the same memory footprint with respect to the metadata. Therefore, if there are too many small files, it's better to just combine them to form a single single uh, file. And we generally keep the format as sequence file format. Okay, we keep receiving these emails from our admin to get rid of small files as it creates name node issues. That's right. That's right. So since name node keeps the information about the files, so that if there are more files, there'll be more information and Therefore, name node ends up getting choked. Okay, good question. So a question from Green is, is, is Spark has, be, has Spark beaten the MapReduce benchmark? Why is it still used? So Spark has beaten the MapReduce benchmark and why is MapReduce still used? That is the question. So say, because of the legacy reasons, a lot of the codes have been already written with MapReduce. Therefore, it's good to know, good to know how to launch MapReduce, okay? Also, as a philosophy, MapReduce is a very good philosophy and that same framework or same philosophy is used by MongoDB, Cassandra, and other frameworks. Therefore, it is good to know what, it goes, what goes inside MapReduce, all right? Question from uh, Madhav is that we use Hive for querying through SDFS. We use Spark Scala for the same thing. Okay, Hive is for querying the data data stored in HDFS or HBase. Similarly, Spark and Scala also used for a similar thing, just tiny bit of difference. When you use Hive, you can only write SQL queries, but when you are using Spark and Scala, you can do all kinds of complex processing things that you cannot do in SQL, okay? A question from uh, someone is that, isn't Kafka part of Hadoop ecosystem? No, Kafka is a separate component. It doesn't come under the Hadoop ecosystem. But uh, in the when, when we are going to learn Spark streaming, we are going to uh, learn through, uh, we are going to go through the Kafka also. So we'll learn Kafka as well while doing this Spark streaming chapter, okay? So a question is, can we use Flume with other file systems? Flume is, yes, as per their papers, yes, as per their configurations, you can define the, define the data source, uh, as in data destination, in others as well, but it's generally used only with HDFS. Okay, a question is in commercial environment, do people directly use cloud data or Hortonwork distribution? Generally, yes, but at, at the end of the day, the, the way we are going to work here, that's the way you're going to work with Hortonworks or cloud data in both the cases, all right? A question is, is MapReduce like a compiler? Not really, MapReduce is more like it takes your code, executes it, gathers the data, orders it, and then execute your other piece of code. It is basically like a software that uh, runs your runs your um, compiled code. Okay, so you submit the compiled MapReduce code to the MapReduce framework, and it'll run those pieces of code. 
basically Java program, which is running in the network. Great set of questions. A question is, this is the standard process as you have under, yeah, this is basically the standard process. Okay, please clarify, clarify will everything will go through MapReduce, either Spark and Yarn. So Spark will also go through Yarn, okay? And MapReduce will also go through Yarn. So both, both MapReduce and Spark would run on top of Yarn. The Spark can also run on other frameworks similar to Yarn, okay, such as Mesos. And Spark and Yarn are both independent. Okay, a question from Satyajit is, which database is good to learn, MongoDB, Cassandra, or MySQL? MySQL is something that you should, you must learn. Nevertheless, you should know how to write queries. When, we, when it comes to databases, uh, specifically that relational databases, one thing that you must learn is how to write a SQL query. That has the biggest advantage, okay? How to write a SQL query is what you need to learn, and then, when it comes to distributed data databases, the one thing that you need to learn is how to create, how to model your data, how to create your data model. Okay, that is the important part when we talk about MongoDB or Cassandra. Now, which database should, out of MongoDB and Cassandra you should use? You should learn. I would say that um, Cassandra will be uh, better to learn than MongoDB or you, you, you learn HBase, okay? Either HBase or Cassandra. Good news is both are similar and yes. All right, I'll keep the MongoDB as a third priority because MongoDB kind of uh, could not catch up with the Cassandra and uh, HBase. I hope uh, I don't get, end up with the flame bots. All right, so great, great set of questions moving ahead. All right, so um, great, great. And uh, now let me talk a bit about Spark. Spark is a general engine for large scale data processing. It's really fast MapReduce. It's around 100 times faster when it's done in the memory. It's 10 times faster in the usual way. So it builds on the similar paradigms or similar way like MapReduce, but it is a different software, but it is very well integrated with Hadoop, okay? So Spark Core can, can interact with all the data sources, whether it's Cassandra, MongoDB, Hive, HBase, HDFS, Techion like Alexio. So Spark can interact with all of these file systems, okay? Spark can interact with all of these file systems and uh, that's the advantage that Spark Core has. A question from I, uh, IBM admin is that pig also, so pig also can interact, but pig doesn't have a storage, so there's no point of Spark being able to talk to pig, okay? So Spark can run on top of Yarn, Hadoop, in case you don't have Hadoop and you are just using EC2, that also Spark can run on. In case you have another kind of resource manager called Mesos, which is a competitor of Hadoop Yarn, then also it can run. In case you don't have either of these, even then it comes with its own resource manager that you can use. On top of Spark Core, there are these, Spark Core basically provides you a way to write the code so that your code can be distributed very well, right? On the, on the Spark core, we have these wonderful libraries called data frames, streaming, MLlib, and GraphX. These are really good libraries, and these libraries provide a way to write complex processing, such as with GraphX, you can do graph-based computing. With MLlib, you can do machine learning work. With streaming, you can process real-time data. 
with data frame you can write sql query or the queries like r there is a programming language called r that's a pioneer in data frames so spark borrowed the idea of data frame from r okay so so basically to make our life easier spark has created spark team has created these wonderful libraries which we can use to do all kinds of processing okay and the great news is you can use r you can use python you can use sql you can use java you can use scala you can use any of these programming languages to do all kinds of processing by reading data from all the places and by running your programs on top of any of the existing list cluster so that's the amazing part about spark and this is the reason why spark is winning the game okay a question from uh, ibm admin is that we can have mongodb uh, also here yes we can have mongodb here that's right good point yes we could have mongodb here all right a question from green is what is standalone i'll just answer that, that question so let's say your organization is not using hadoop but they are on ec2 then also you can use spark on top of amazon ec2 ec2 is elastic computing cloud okay this is a hosted service now sometimes what you have is instead of people using hadoop yarn sometimes they have another resource manager such as mesos spark can run on there now let's say you you want to just do some processing and you neither have hadoop nor have amazon ec2 nor have mesos in that case you can just double click on spark core and it will launch that's one of the standalone modes there is another standalone mode is using a standalone mode you can create a cluster of spark which can run your computing parallelly in the network so instead of installing hadoop yarn just for just for purpose of spark you can just install spark on all the machine double click on standalone mode on all the machine let it discover other machines and form the network okay so you you will have to make a list of all the ip addresses on which you are going to install spark and that's called the standalone mode in standalone mode it basically interacts with each other figures out who, who figures out how many machines are there and so on okay but the most optimum way of using a spark is using it on top of yarn okay because hadoop anyway has the data distributed on on the entire cluster and when you are running spark on mapreduce it runs the programs nearer to the data a question is how do we interact with yarn does it have an interface or we can interact directly good question you can generally take a look at say job browser okay using job browser you are interacting with yarn you are you will be able to see all the processes that are running similarly if you are a console kind of person you can generally use a command like yarn and talk to the resource manager you will not have much to do there you will generally basically you will um either kill the job or see the log errors of the job okay so that's about that's about the okay all right so yes you need admin rights if you want to fiddle with somebody else's process if to interact with to interact with yarn if you are trying to see some uh, somebody else's logs you will need to be admin otherwise you can just access normally okay right now i'm just in in the um, hue here i'm just another user you can see sandeep giri 9034 i'm just another user and this job browser shows all the jobs okay right now i don't think i have any jobs running all right i don't have any job running but if i remove my name from that filter probably it will show other people's job as well you can see so these are the various jobs running in the cluster right now okay so that was a overview of various uh, components and in case you are looking forward to using say 
uh, Spark, you can either use PySpark as a command. That's a Python version of Spark. Okay. And if you want to run scalar version of Spark, you can say Spark shell. Okay, let me just move it a bit. All right. Similarly, you have Spark SQL and there are quite a few interfaces that we learn during the course. So that was a brief introduction about Spark. So you can you can sign up for the course, full course for rest of the sessions. Okay, and you can go here and we have a couple of wonderful courses that you might be interested in. Like for example, we have come up with, we, we have normal Hadoop and Spark course. Hadoop course and Spark course. Uh, Spark course is what is starting now. Okay, so you can enroll and uh, here. So you can enroll and um, see the details. And also we have come up with a very good course for called AI ML for manager, which is a deep dive into machine learning without the maths. Okay, so this is uh, something that is uh, coming up. And these are the various courses that you can sign up and there are free courses that you can go through. All right. So, a question uh, is, do we have any do we have any interfaces to write queries? Yes, we have interfaces like here. You can query editor hive, pig, or job designer. And uh, in case you want to interact with the, let's say you don't like the this kind of interface, and you would like to interact with interact with Spark from the terminal, then you can simply uh, simply go to Jupyter. Okay, you can you can use it from a clean interface like this one. Okay, Jupyter is a simple, a very uh, browser friendly tool to interact with various components. So you can just start with Apache Tori. Okay, so here you can also you can also interact with the Spark from here, okay? So let's say I'm loading some data, some data from se.txt file and from, let's say this folder, data, mr, word count, and slash input, okay? All right. So this file that I'm accessing is having this kind of data. So this is how I can talk to the data through Spark. If I want to take a look at this file directly, this folder directly, I can go here and click on file browser and, and go to that particular file. Okay, let me just show you. Okay, let me just go to that particular folder that I just did. So these two files combined together is what we are processing from here. Okay, so you can see that using using uh, this Jupyter Notebook for Scala, we can also interact with Spark. SC means Spark and we, Spark context and that's how we're doing. So we were able to read a file from HDFS. Using Spark, we can do many more computation, you can take a look. You can take a look. There are quite a few computation that are uh, that are available on this data set. All right, so that's how we can interact with Spark, either from the command line, from the notebook, and so on. Okay, a question from S. Williams is, recently I heard about Snappy Data. Could you please explain to me? A snappy Data is basically a format, as far as I know, Snappy Data. So it's basically a format. No, it's actually interesting. So it's basically a data database. I'll take a look at it. All right, thank you for letting me know. All right, let me take a note. Okay, so 
as per my understanding earlier, Snappy data was one of the data formats that we were handling. A question is, can I bring in data from multiple sources like Hive, Cassandra, Flame, Scoop and process them together using Spark data frame? But correct, that's right. Using a Spark data frame, you can connect the data from all data sources and process them uh, or join them in order to get the results, okay? And you can also perform MLLib on top of it. So your assumption is right. So, not scoop scoop doesn't is not a data source it's basically a tool that brings data from one place to another similar is the flume but using hive using sdfs using cassandra you can create data frames or also using classic database so you can create the data frame from everywhere and then you can join them together to get the desired output all right great question very great question so all right. All right. A question is how we understand data or system. Uh, okay. So I would say that uh, you start solving the problems and then you will learn it uh, in due course. Okay, I would suggest that you attend this course on Spark that should help you understanding the Spark in details. In this course, we actually go through a lot of details. I'll just uh, share with you. All right, so here, if you go into this course, okay, so here the learning path, we basically go through in case of spark we this is what is going on right now okay we basically go through the environment again and we will understand the handling of various files inputs we'll understand the scalar basics and we'll also understand the spark basics here and we'll learn the deploying of applications and we will learn the learn a lot of things in details including the Spark streaming, MLLib, Spark, GraphX, and so on, on top of MLLib. Okay, a question from Azil is that if you want to start learning Spark, how much hardware do we need? Not much, you can actually run on your local machine, okay? Or if you have really low-end machine, you can actually use just CloudX Lab subscription, and that should be sufficient for learning Spark, all right? And for Spark, you don't require Hadoop or any other installation. Spark can run without any of the resource managers. All right, so you don't really need multiple machines. Okay, but it's generally a good idea to have multiple machines. Question from Vivek is, do you have specific courses for functional product managers who can use? Yes, that's exactly the plan is with respect to AI ML for managers functional product managers. In this, we don't go into details of nuances of programming language or mathematics. Here, we basically understand the machine learning concepts in detail, okay? So that this, this course is designed for, for most of the product managers, all right? Okay. So this course is something that, that we are working hard on. Something that um, is unique to us is uh, something that uh, nobody has tried to create such a course before. There is Coursera, which does deep dive, and there are very high-end courses which are for CXOs, but there is nothing which balances the two. Okay, so that's why we created this course. All right. Right. So here, what we learn in this course is the detailed concept of machine learning, starting with ensemble learning and so on. And, and, and we go into the details of everything without bringing the, the mathematics or too much programming in between. Okay, so this course will be good for, for people who are from, from non-programming backgrounds. All right, so great, great. We still have 20 minutes. If you have more questions, please feel free to ask. If you have 
Okay. A question is how long we will have access to CloudX Lab? 90 days or one year? It'll be 90 days. Okay. But you can you can always extend it. Uh, it's very, very low cost. Okay. It's not we have kept the price so low that everybody can everybody can use it. We don't want to make money out of it. Instead, we want more and more users using it. Okay. We have anyway taken the taken the same resources, so it's better that be more people use it. So we want to keep the 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 cost really low. Okay. Something like fifteen fifteen dollar in a month or nine dollar in a month for the whole cluster. Okay, a suggestion, uh, a question is, if someone from programming language, is there a next course? I would suggest that you take up a Spark developer course. This is for, this is for, um, this is for anyone who is from, okay, who is from programming background. This, this course is very much detailed and takes, uh, you will learn the distributed computing. This course is, about distributed computing, all right? Specifically processing. A question from Madhav is, what are the roles available in ecosystem? There are quite a few roles like data engineer, data architect, data analyst, and so on. There are, there's a place for everyone in the ecosystem of Hadoop and machine learning. So, yeah. A question from Surendra is, I've taken ML course from Coursera from Stanford. How useful for me to take AI ML course uh, for managers offered by you? All right, so to go through the um, curriculum and while you're going through the curriculum of the course, you will get, an, get a picture of what all will be taught, okay? If you already know those concepts, then it may not be useful to you. If you don't know those concept, then it might be useful to you, okay? So, so you can say that whatever you learn as part of the Coursera uh, course, Coursera machine learning, deep learning course, um, that course from the perspective of the business managers, it is, okay, without the maths, without the programming. All right. Good questions. A question is, can you give examples of how would a data scientist use Spark? Data scientists can use Spark for cleaning up the data. And, and they will be basically, the data engineers would help converting the raw data into the data frames. And the, the data scientists would basically take the data frames and do the rest of the processing. Okay, data scientists do use Spark in order to do, say, machine learning, in order to do analytics, in order to do uh, further slicing and dicing of the data. So Spark is very much used by, by everyone. Okay, great question. Yes, somebody has raised a hand. All right, wonderful. Um, Okay, a question is, um, a question from Aksham is, semi-structured data I did not understand with your talk. Semi-structured data is the data that, like for example, you have comma separated values, right? In that, if you are loading that data, you will know that, okay, that columns are separated based on the comma, but what's there in the column is not clear, right? You don't know whether it's in teaser, whether it's a string, whether it's a date, and so on. Therefore, therefore, you need to translate or you need to understand that data to convert it into something which has the data types. So semi-structured data does not, we don't know, we don't know the data types of the columns, though we know what are the columns. So that's basically semi-structured data. Semi-structured data requires less effort to convert into structured data as compared to converting unstructured data to structured data, okay? A question from Amit is, CloudX Lab uses Hortonworks or Cloudera? We use best of both, 
as in we install the cluster using Hortonworks, then we pick the components from Cloudera and use those. We also use uh, at CloudX Lab, we also have installed all the libraries required for various data processing like R, R, Pandas, NumPy, and every library of machine learning has been installed on CloudX Lab so that everybody can mix and match and do experimentation and learn, okay? Spark is common then? Yes, Spark is common and Spark is common for processing, okay? And which cloud is used for training? This CloudX Lab is installed on AWS and that's what we use for training, okay? Our focus is going to be best for both worlds. Here, we are not trying to sell the software as like Cloudera and Hortonworks, both of them are trying to sell their own software. But in our case, we are trying to make uh, people solve large scale problems. We are helping people la solving large scale problems. And that's why we do not want to be bound by a particular, particular, uh, particular package. Therefore, we are taking a stand whereby we take both best of both worlds. And that's why our course basically makes everyone ready for, for Cloudera or Hortonworks both certificates, okay? A question is, should I consider this course would be for admin related work? No, in this course, we do not learn admin related things. It'll be more of engineering, architecture, developer, programming, those kind that that will be what we will be learning in this part, part of the course. We'll be learning how to break down your program into distributed computing. All right, using Spark. All right, specifically, we'll spend some amount of time in converting unstructured data to a structure. And afterwards, we'll learn how to process the structured data. And then we will learn how to do machine learning and graph based computing on top of the data. The question is, do you have any programming course on R? Uh, not yet, not yet. We don't have a programming course on R. We have shifted to Python and consciously we made a choice of uh, creating even the machine learning course in Python, okay? Question is, you mentioned something about Pig not having the storage. Can you elaborate? Pig is basically a translator under the hood is using MapReduce. So Pig has no place to store data, okay? And, but, but as in pig does not have a uh, storage, pig, using pig, you basically load the data from HDFS or any other source and store the data back into HDFS or any other source. It doesn't have its own storage or any service. It's just a command. Should I consider this course for admin? Okay. A question is R language is Spark R? Yes. The way PySpark starts Python, Spark Shell starts Scala, Spark R launches R and provides you a way to interact with Spark using R as a programming language. Okay. Good questions. Very good questions. All right. Question is, can we send more questions through email? Yes, definitely. You uh, drop us an email at reaches. Okay, so the next session of this course is going to be on 29 September and reach out to us at reaches at CloudX Lab. Okay. Sure, everybody will get the presentation and I'll be sharing it soon. All right, the email ID is reaches at CloudX Lab, okay? Reaches at CloudX Lab. Me and my team would answer there, all right?
All right. Okay, a uh, question from Satyajit is, I want to take the course, uh, any opportunity for placement assistance? Sure, we basically keep connecting people to various uh, job offers, okay? And we are also launching these hiring hackathons on our CloudX Lab platform so that everyone uh, can get a quick opportunity to for the placement in various territories, all right? Good that you're already aware about the job section on CloudX Lab. There is something called job section in which we basically post jobs. Okay. And we'll be posting more jobs here. A lot of people keep on approaching just that we avoid those jobs. Okay. And okay. So we will definitely help you out with uh, by connecting to people. All right, make sure that you keep your score up. The score that uh, displays on the right corner, like for me, it's 16,000. Keep your score up so that you get more opportunities. All right, great. And also complete the to-do list there in the course. A question uh, is how many hours of training in there? Around 30 hours will be supporting personal project. So we would definitely guide you, but you will have to take the first step in your personal project. Okay. All right, there are, uh, I think one or two more seats left in this course in case anybody is interested, they can sign up before the next session. The next session is on 29th September. This will happen on every Saturday, Sunday. So you can say five weeks. It'll take five weeks to complete the course. All right. So you can, those who are interested, they can enroll for the course. All right. You can enroll for the course here. All right. Great. This is uh, one of the more de most detailed course on Spark. And uh, we will be going into more and more details. It's a very hands on course. We will be learning as part of this course. First, we will learn a new programming language called Scala. Even if you have no experience with Scala or Python or any other language, you will be teaching you Scala in this course, and then we'll learn how to the learn the foundation of Spark. Then we'll go into data frames. We'll learn Spark streaming, and we'll learn how to deal with all kinds of data formats. And we'll also learn how to do MLlib and GraphX as part of this course. Okay. The question is, do you have any course related to NIFI? Not yet, but we are planning to do so. All right. Great. Wonderful to have all of you in the session. We have a Python in our machine learning course. So we teach Python there, but, but Python is all Python course is also available for free as part of CloudX Lab. Python course, Java course is available for free as part of uh, CloudX Lab. All right, so wonderful to have all of you in the session. Great set of questions. The if you are interested, you can either go for self-paced or live, or you can just take up the lab and, and keep on practicing as per your as per your time. All right. So I look forward to have a more interaction with you. If you have more questions, feel free to ask. We ensure that every question get answered. All right. So great, great to have all of you in the session. Please feel free to ask questions. I hope I've not missed anybody's question so far. Lab access will be there even after course completion. And the course content will also be there lifelong.
Okay, uh, question from Satyajit is, thanks for the session. When will be your AI ML meetup session? I have seen somewhere. We are planning soon. We are planning soon. You will get the update. I think it's in October, first week. All right, I hope this session was useful. I hope this has given you a basic foundation. It's completely okay. Uh, a lot of users in this session are from various backgrounds. So they, you may not like uh, this particular course, Big Data with Spark, but there are other courses and stay connected. There are more things coming up at CloudX Lab. So I look forward to, I look forward to have more interaction and yes. There are probably one or two seats available in this course. Probably they'll be filled by now. I hope so. I hope not. Okay. All right. Great. Great to have all of you in the session. Um, I'm very happy to say that we are the most active community on the internet on big data and AI. All right. We have 21,000 users in Meetup Group. That's uh, the the maximum number there. And uh, we have had very good set of users with CloudXF. Thanks to all of you. We are really proud to have a great user base. All right, so stay connected. If you have any question, reach out to us at any point of time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for great set of questions and all right. More sessions will be coming up soon. So stay connected, stay tuned, and uh, all right. So my name is, uh, I'll just, okay. So I'm Sandeep Giri, and I hope you can see me. I look forward to see you and you can send me the LinkedIn request and that'll also be good. All right, so great. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to see you in the, in the next session. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Yes, we all will get the recordings. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Don. Bye, Satyajit. Bye, Shrendra. Bye, Hanu. Bye, uh, everyone. Please uh, give the feedback uh, on the form that was shared earlier. All right. Great. Yes, uh, you have a question. Okay, you come over to the, uh, just you can use this Using URL, you can enroll, okay? You can enroll using this URL, all right? Great, great to have all of you in the session. I hope it was useful. Yes, anyone can watch the Python tutorial. Come over, if you have any questions, just uh, let me know, done. I would love to help you out. Great, thank you, Vajay. Thank you, Don. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to see you in the future sessions as well as on the forum. Okay, so there are a lot of resources on CloudX Lab. We are dedicated to helping people in the new age technologies, and and there's a lot of users, and there are there are many people who are who are working with us. Many of our learners are helping each other. Okay, uh, question is, are you going to visit Riyadh? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I have some students there, they, but um, no plans as of yet. I did have plans last year. Okay, so, but if you have any questions specifically, then just let me know. The email ID is reach us at CloudX Lab. Great, great, thank you everyone. I Yes, so this all of the sessions are going to be online.
there are two kinds of uh, courses one is uh, self paced which is at at your own pace you can learn the other kind of courses are the instructor led courses like this one but most of the sessions are going to be smaller uh, smaller group of people we do not want to go beyond 20 people in a session okay so and uh, every question is answered and we basically celebrate the questions asked by the users and that's the way we have seen that most of our learners have done very well in their career most of the thought leaders that you see on big data they have been uh, part of our uh, our students okay so a uh, lot of people have uh, connected well with us okay so you can uh, register with this url uh, andy okay so you will have to enroll because rest of the sessions are paid and yes great great to have all of you in the session wonderful set of questions feel free to reach out to us at any point of time yes uh, yeah, Prasant's question is, will this course suffice as the requirement for Hortonworks or Cloud Era certification, or we need to put more effort on it? This course basically suffices for both, okay? Along with this, you might have to take up the big, big data with Hadoop, okay? So yeah, that you can just take up on by at later point of time or even together. So everything is available in both forms, self-paced and, and live. All right, great, great to have all of you in the session. Please feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so you can register for the next course using enrolling on this. And if you are interested in AI for managers or AI specialization, machine learning specialization, please feel free to do so. This is one of the deep dive courses and okay. So great, great to have all of you in the session and stay connected at CloudX Lab because there are quite a few things out there uh, that you can use right away. Also, you can, you can uh, send me a LinkedIn request. Some of you have already sent the LinkedIn request. Just put an, uh, put a, message saying that you attended the session okay uh, because i generally have just too many requests to answer okay so great great to have all of you in the session bye bye have a good day bye